morning, Calvary Nexus. It is always good to be here with you to study the Word together. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, please turn or tap to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. And Lord willing, we are going to get through the whole chapter. Some of you laugh because you've heard me teach before. We will get through the whole chapter, I promise. Uh, Most of you guys know that I was raised in a believing household with faithful parents who taught us to love God, love neighbor, and to make disciples. But uh, in early high school, I started to question a lot of my faith, and it wasn't until I was about 16 or 17 that I uh, really rededicated myself to the Lord. And I remember this season of just jumping back in, getting into church community, getting to serve with others, that there was this period where I just found a new love of the scriptures. It was just countless hours sitting with the Bible, reading through it over and over, digging deeper into commentaries, going to Bible studies. But I remember specifically that I was just pulled into the New Testament. Because I had heard all of these short little verses that you see on the coffee mugs and you see on the back of the cars and you see on picture frames and houses. And I realized, oh my gosh, there's more. Like there's a context to all of these verses that I know so well. And I loved specifically the books of Paul and his letters, just the way that he thought, just spoke to me. But then I realized over time that my focus wasn't just on the New Testament because I love the New Testament, but there was a very real part of me that was avoiding the Old Testament. And it wasn't because I wasn't fascinated by it, it was because I was legitimately afraid of it. And I was afraid of it because I just didn't understand it. You guys been there? You're just reading through the Old Testament and you're like, who is Melchizedek? I'm going to go to the New Testament who's Melchizedek, right? And he pops up again. And so I was not a fan of it in that sense. But through the encouragement of others and through the guidance of the Spirit, I began to dig in. And I enjoyed the narratives and the stories and the poetry and the prophecies. Like, it was legitimately fascinating to me. Uh, But it wasn't until I really started to dig deep that I found a legitimate world that was like unknown to me. For years since I was a kid, I had known most of these stories at a basic level, right? I I knew about Adam and Eve in the garden and there's a snake and I knew about Noah and there was a flood and there was a rainbow and we like rainbows and I knew about Abraham and how he was this really old guy who had a kid and then some other stuff happened and then boom, Israel. And I know about David and how he found the rocks and he slayed the giant and I want to be a David. But it was in these studies that I began to see these weren't just isolated stories with these cute little songs that we sing on Sundays in a VBS. But that every one of these people, every circumstance that we come across in the scriptures, we're all connected They were all woven together to tell the greater story of the gospel of Jesus. And as we look from Genesis to Revelation throughout Scripture, what we see is that God has been leading humanity to better places. Even in the garden, when all things fall apart, he's like, we're going to remove them from the garden so this problem isn't permanent and we're going to fix it. He hears his people crying in Egypt. He says, we're going to take you out of here. The wilderness might be uncomfortable for a little bit, but we're going to get you to the promised land. We're going to take 12 guys in their daily lives. We're going to make them a little uncomfortable for a couple years to show them that I'm going to change the world. God is always leading his people to better places. And in our study in Hebrews, we're seeing this idea that Jesus is greater And we're learning about the implications that that has on our lives and how Jesus leads us to greater places. And what we're going to see is that as our high priest, Jesus offers us new life by leading us to a better covenant. And so today we're going to discover how we can experience the blessings of Jesus as our great high priest in the service that he provides. And we're going to see the benefits of the new covenant that he offers us. Sound good? All right, let's read a couple of verses to get us started. Hebrews chapter 8, starting at verse 1. The author says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. 
We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if you were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he, being Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment together where we get to open up your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is leading and guiding us into all truth. So open our hearts, open our minds to receive from you and you alone this morning. Be glorified in us and through us and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So the subject of our chapter this morning is Jesus' priestly service and new covenant. Jesus' is priestly service, and a new covenant. And the object that I believe God has for us this morning is simply that we would experience that better covenant that he has to offer. Not simply know about it or of it, but that we would experience it together. So some quick context. We are now officially halfway through our study in the book of Hebrews. We're a little bit further than halfway through the book, but we are halfway through our study breakout. And in the first seven chapters, the author of Hebrews focuses on the person and the work of Jesus, specifically as our high priest. And beginning here, at chapter 8, the author shifts the focus a little bit, and he focuses in on the specific results of Jesus as our high priest, namely the better covenant that he provides, the better sanctuary that he serves in, and the better sacrifice that he offers. And so Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to dig deeper into this better covenant and see the results of that covenant. Now, the passage is naturally broken into two sections. And so we're going to walk through those two sections together. And so for the first half, we're going to look at the service of our better high priest. Now, as we read those first two verses, a lot of that content might have sounded a little bit familiar. And it's because these two verses serve as a reiteration of the main point that the author has just made. He says, this is the main point, that we have this high priest. And we saw how that works, as Chase walked us through chapter 7 so wonderfully last week. And we see that Jesus, as our high priest, acts as our mediator, this perfect bridge between God and man, as the only one who is fully God and fully man, makes him the perfect mediator for us. But I love the language used here, and I don't want to get distracted by it, but I do want to point it out, that our high priest is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's powerful language, and I love it for two reasons. One is because as we talked about these high priests of the earthly priesthood that would be constantly serving, constantly making sacrifices up and down, day in, day out, the language that is used of Jesus is that he is seated because his work is done. I love that. But then the author goes beyond that, and he shows us where he is seated, at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. This isn't just some position that he found. This is a position of honor given to him as he rules and reigns in authority from heaven. I love that. And so taking that picture of Jesus as our high priest, the author goes into the service provided to us by him. And the first is that we learn that he offers a better gift and sacrifice. We're told that every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. See, the role of high priest was an incredible honor amongst the priesthood and amongst the people of Israel. This was a legitimate once-in-a-lifetime opportunity if you were one of the blessed ones who got this opportunity. And yet it was also a very specific work. See, daily the high priest tended to the temple. They were maintaining order and structure, watching over the rest of the priesthood. And on that one day, that day of atonement, they would get to go into the Holy of Holies, making that sin offering for themselves and for the people. They must give these gifts and offerings. It was their call, their express responsibility. 
And as such, we're told that as our high priest, Jesus must also make an offering. He must also give that gift and sacrifice. But rather than the sacrifice of animals, that was a symbolic covering of our sins, cleansing of the temple, Jesus makes the ultimate sacrifice. And he gives himself, wholly and completely washing us clean. So how is that better? How is giving himself better than the old system of sacrifices? Well, a lot of it is revealed in the language that the author uses here. I told the high priests were appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Gifts and sacrifices. Now, we could just look at these two terms as individual references, likely one to uh, the giving of meal offerings as gifts and one to blood offerings as the giving of sacrifices. But it's much more likely that there is a more profound meaning that the author wants to get across. See, in using both of these terms together, the point that's being made is that Jesus and his sacrifice is making a sacrifice sufficient for the whole sacrificial system as a whole. All of the sacrificial law is completed through the work of Jesus so that sins might be forgiven forever. And I just want to take a moment to let that reality sink in. I want you to think of an area in your life where you may be feeling a little bit distant from God. That might make you a little bit uncomfortable. You're like, no, we're tight. We're real tight. But just that place that you feel like you've strayed. Or that one area of your life that just, you keep feeling like you're falling short. Tomorrow's going to be better. I promise, Jesus. And then tomorrow is tomorrow. <laughs> it's hard, just like today. And I don't want to leave you in that feeling. I want you to take that feeling and I want you to realize that under the sacrifice that Jesus makes, forgiveness of all those shortcomings is offered to you immediately. And any gap that you feel between you and God has been closed. That you have him in the fullest sense in every single moment all because Jesus gives the better gift and sacrifice. We also see that in his service, Jesus serves in a heavenly ministry. Jesus serves in a heavenly ministry. So this, in these next few verses, verses 4 and 5, the author expands on the nature of Jesus' earthly, or excuse me, priestly ministry, and he gives us two insights about his ministry. The first is that his ministry is distinct from the earthly priesthood. It's distinct from the earthly priesthood. See, since its establishment in Exodus 28, the priesthood was built around Aaron, Moses' brother, and his sons. This was the Levitical priesthood. And every priest was a descendant from Aaron, from the tribe of Levi. Now, we know of Jesus and his genealogy. He did not come from the tribe of Levi. Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah, meaning that he was not qualified to be a priest. Well, that doesn't seem fair. He's Jesus. He could do anything. <laughs> but he wasn't. He was not qualified. And this shows us that the priesthood that Jesus serves in is different from the earthly priesthood. It wasn't an extension or an expansion of the priest of Levi. His ministry was altogether better in every single way imaginable. He did not serve in the earthly temples. He serves in the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle, the true dwelling place of the Lord. And that is a beautiful picture but I also want to point out that though it is distinct from the earthly priesthood, it would be altogether wrong to say that Jesus' ministry is disconnected from the earthly priesthood because it was his priesthood that is the template for the earthly priesthood. See, what we don't want to do is view the Old Testament as, and its institutions as just complete failures. 
or these man-made systems that were made in blatant disregard for God's will. Like, let's just figure out how to do this priest thing. No, the earthly priesthood served its purpose just like God had intended it. See, we see again in the book of Exodus that God is constantly helping Moses learn how to lead the people of Israel and specifically lead the people into deeper and more profound worship of the Lord. And in Exodus 25, he's instructing Moses how to create the tabernacle, this physical place where the manifestation of the Lord resided with the people. And he says in Exodus 25, verse 40, And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. He's building the tabernacle. He says, see to it that as you build this, my place of dwelling, that you build it according to this pattern that I show you. See, even in the wilderness, God's people were meant to operate in order and in structure. An order and structure divinely revealed through God himself that what they created was a copy or a shadow of the true eternal dwelling place of God. And that is where Jesus serves. And so as we watch the priests perform their religious duties for generations, all of this work was meant to point to the better work of our heavenly priest in his heavenly ministry. So what is that ministry? Well, we're told in the next verse that Jesus, in his priesthood, mediates a better covenant. Verse 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And this is the specific part of our high priest ministry outlined in this chapter. That for all that he does to us, the author wants us to understand he mediates a better covenant built upon better promises. Our God is a God of covenants, contracts, establishing relationships. And we see a variety of different covenants that he makes between himself and mankind, but there are four distinct ones that we see in the Old Testament. God creates covenants between Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. And with each one of these, He establishes his desire to be with his people, where they would be set apart for him, and he would be their God. But we learn in verse 6 that for as amazing as that thought was in all of those covenants, God was always working towards a better covenant, a covenant given through Jesus. And so that might lead us to the question, what makes this covenant better? And that is the second section that we're going to study today, the results of this better covenant that make it better. See, there are numerous benefits afforded to God's people through the new covenant that are outlined in the Bible. And as we learn to appreciate the work of Jesus as our high priest at at deeper levels, it helps us to experience the blessings that this covenant offers. If we don't understand the covenant, we're not going to actually enter into all that it has to offer us. And so there's four results that the author of Hebrews notes here that I hope will help us to greater appreciate and experience this covenant. First result is that it resolves the fault of the first covenant. Starting at verse 7, let's read to verse 9. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So the author notes something really cool about this covenant. He says that it isn't just better, he says that it was necessary. And I want to point that out because in a day and age where we upgrade our smartphones every single year just because we can, I think we've lost a sense of the difference between better and necessary. I was rocking an iPhone 6S as long as I could. 
and somebody had pity on me, and they were like, here, please take my 11. I can't stand you on that anymore. And I held that 11 for as long as I could till I was like, the buttons don't work, and the screen doesn't swipe. And I finally got an iPhone 14 Pro, and I'm like, this thing's amazing. And then the 15 comes out, and you're like, well, that thing's pretty amazing too. <laughs> so might as well trade this one in, get that. It's better. But is it necessary? Amen. See, everything, excuse me, everything that's better isn't always necessary. If you want to get the new phone, that's fine. This is not about technology. <laughs> but everything that is necessary is always going to be better. And here's why I point that out, because when we're talking about Jesus, a lot of times I'll find myself and I'll hear others talking about Jesus and they'll say, life with Jesus is better. Talking with our coworkers. Hey, how was your weekend? Ah, oh, went to church. It was great, man. It's life with Jesus is so much better. I don't know how people get through their work week. You're talking to your family at Thanksgiving, like, oh my gosh, I'm sending up prayers for you guys because that's always scary. You're sitting with family. Ah, oh, so like... What are we all thankful for? Jesus, right? And we like to say that it's better. But a response that I've gotten, and maybe a response that you've gotten or will get, is, yeah, that's great. But honestly, I'm kind of happy with the way life is right now. So maybe that's better. Maybe it's better for you. But I'm, I'm good right now. The problem with that is that it's really hard to argue against that. There are people who are living from a very earthly sense in great contentment. Who are happy with the way things are. And they'll be happy with the way things are until the day they die. So sure, life with Jesus might be better. But why are they going to shake up what's already really, really good? But as soon as we reframe that Amen. and say life with Jesus is necessary, that'll change the conversation. And so the author of Hebrews doesn't say this covenant isn't just better, it's necessary. And it was necessary because there was a fault found in the first covenant. And this fault wasn't with God and his ability to uphold promises or his desire to be faithful to his people. You spend any amount of time looking through the scriptures, what you will see is a very patient God, a very steadfast God. Even when you're in the Old Testament and you're like, man, that guy is angry. You know what he does? He continues his remnant. He continues to build his people. He continues to extend forgiveness. He continues to lead them on to better places. I mean, even Paul writes to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, if we are faithless, God remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. If he makes a promise and you are faithless, he is going to be faithful. He will not change that about himself. That is who our God is. And he has always been determined to redeem mankind. And he's going to be faithful to make that happen. So despite... Our inabilities to uphold that old covenant, he will be faithful. And he does that by creating a new, better covenant. Not an improvement or an amendment to the old one, but one entirely new on new promises. I so said, what fault does the covenant resolve? Well, the central idea, the most important idea, is that this covenant leads to life and not to death. Under the dispensation of the law given to Israel through Moses, God shows the people his moral standards. He shows them how they might live in a good and holy and righteous community. But that also meant that if they were to live by the law, they were to be judged by the law. And we know that any shortcoming of the law is identified as sin. And Paul tells us in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is Death. That is the penalty for any such sin. And that was the glaring issue with the first covenant. No matter how hard one tried to uphold it, they were bound to be failures. And these failures naturally led to the consequence of death. Now, this was God, not God's desire. 
The Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 3 that God desires that none would perish, but that all would turn to repentance. And so in sending Christ to offer a new covenant, he resolves this issue by giving us a covenant that leads to life. So we might ask, how does this new covenant lead to life? Well, primarily, this covenant is based on grace and not the law. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But he has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In order to offer new life, Jesus, or excuse me, God has to change the very nature of the covenant. No longer were people bound by the law. No longer were people obligated to earn. And this was always God's intention. We see this in this covenant with Abraham. That he was always leading his people to deeper faith. And we see that in this new covenant. This covenant that provides grace as a free gift through Jesus, made possible through his holy life and his perfect death. But the law doesn't just disappear. God established the law. He established it with good intentions. So I want us to understand just the lengths that Jesus goes to to offer us grace in this new covenant. As Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount and he's showing us kingdom life, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. When Jesus comes to earth as man and he lives perfectly, he shows us how one might live in relationship with God under the old covenant. And as he fulfills the law, it is him who is able to be that substitution for us so that we might no longer have to fulfill the law, but we can receive grace and righteousness on his account. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. He says, for Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. This new covenant offers us new life. And it's not dependent on our adherence to the law, but through the grace of Jesus. And so it's from this idea that I want to lead us into the next result, which is that this covenant gives us assurance of God's promises. Now, If I'm being honest, if there's one thing that I am not sure of in this life, it is my own abilities. And that's not like this false humility where it's like, oh, I'm nothing. Like legitimately, if there's like one thing you're like, what are you not confident in? I'm going to be like myself. Uh, There is just constant fear of failure. There is imposter syndrome galore. I don't know if you guys can relate to that but just these moments of being inadequate. Like, I, I got married at 21 while I was still in school. If there's anything that makes you question your ability to do anything, right, it's getting married at 21 when you're still in school and you're like, oh, shoot, it's like if, if I got to live in a box, I guess my wife has to now too. Right? Like I got to like take care of other people. My abilities do not give me much assurance. So when I consider a covenant with the God of the universe that is dependent upon my abilities, I'm not feeling very sure. I'm not very confident with how that's going to turn out. But that was the old covenant. It was dependent upon God and man. One such place that we see that is in Exodus 19, verse 5. Moses is meeting with God on Mount Sinai, and God tells Moses to remind the people of his covenant with them, And he says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me 
above all people, for all the earth is mine. I want you to look at the emphasis in that. God says, if you will obey, if you will keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. It's a cause and effect. It's a conditional. If you uphold your end of the deal, I will uphold mine. Under that system, my assurance is very low. But praise God, that is not the way of the new covenant. The new covenant is wholly and completely dependent upon God alone. See, in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, what we're specifically looking at here is a prophecy of this covenant that would one day be given to God's people first and then to the rest of the world. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, And while the covenant in Exodus emphasizes this idea of if you, I want us to look at the words of this new covenant. Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see that? No more if you. I will make. I will put, I will write, I will be, and then you shall be my people. Regardless of your ability, my ability to perform, God has guaranteed the continuance of this covenant. And we can have a greater assurance in his promises because it doesn't mean that you have to uphold your end of the deal. By grace, through faith, this covenant will be upheld by the power of God. It's not centered around behavioral modification, but of God desiring to do a true transformative work in and through us, something that only he can start and he can complete. And so we've seen how this new covenant resolves the issue with the first covenant. We've seen how it provides greater assurance of God's promises. Next, I want us to see how this new covenant provides a personal relationship with God. Verse 11 and 12, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. It's very interesting to think that much of the Old Covenant and Old Testament law and prophecies was centered around intellectual understanding and memorization. We see uh, precedents set up like this in Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 11, where God instructs the people to teach all that they've heard to their children, to their neighbors. And it makes sense because for generations, the history of God and man was given oratorily. Most people could not read and they could not write. And so it was passed down by word of mouth. And so as somebody taught you, you had to memorize. And as you memorized, then you could internalize. And then as you internalized, it was your turn to do that for somebody else. And I'll be the first to admit that studying the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures is one of the most profound things that we can do with our time. I can quote the entire Higher series of The Office. I just wanted to brag about that. No, no, no. I'm saying we could spend our time memorizing so much. I want you to think about all the songs that you know all the lyrics to. That's a lot. And we could do that with the scriptures. We can memorize and we can internalize, right? And trust me, it's a good thing. I decided to do it for a living, willingly. Like nobody like strong-armed me into this. They're like, you're going to study the Bible for your living. No, like I want to because it's satisfying. But at the same time, I want to make note that studying the scriptures is so much more profound than just memorization or fact accumulation. There is this true, deeper sense of knowing God. That it's not just memorizing information about him that we might be able to tell somebody else. But that this new covenant allows us to know Jesus through experience. It's the Greek word that John uses, gnosko, to know through experience. 
Because in this new covenant, we have a unique connection with God that was not there before. The indwelling of the Spirit of God himself. 1 John 4.13 By this we know that we abide in him and he abides in us because he has given us of his Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I want you to take a moment to meditate on that idea. That right now, if you have professed faith in Jesus, if you believe the Spirit is dwelling within you right now. That's not just a feel-good phrase. That is an eternal reality. That God has taken residence in you. Not because he's omnipresent and he has to be everywhere, so unfortunately he also has to be in you. But he has chosen to call you his living temple, his dwelling place. So that at any moment you have full access to him. In your more, most desperate of needs, you don't have to wait for a prayer gathering. You have the Spirit to speak with and to in your greatest of joys. You don't have to wait for worship to sing his praises. You can lift them up to him. You have the fullness of God with you wherever you go. And that is all because of this new covenant. He's provided that personal relationship with you. And then lastly, we see the result of this new covenant is that it makes the old covenant unnecessary or obsolete. Our last verse, verse 13. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So remember the context of the book of Hebrews. You have an audience of Jewish converts who had given up family, friends, a lifetime of religion, of daily culture, in order to pursue God through Jesus. That they have really experienced an entire life change. And there are temptations to turn back to Jewish religious roots. And so here's the focal point of the defense that the author of Hebrews is making. That while God provided the first covenant for a specific people, for a specific time, with a specific purpose. He has now revealed a better covenant that makes the old one unnecessary. Obsolete. That's when it's like definitely time to upgrade your phone. Like the old one just doesn't work. Dropped it in the ocean. It's obsolete. This is not pick your preference. It's not appointment at the optometrist. Do you prefer number one or number two? Number one or number two? I think they're the same. Like, they're definitely not. We're not going through this if I'm doing the same ones. The new covenant makes the old one obsolete. There's no need for it in any form. See, Paul kind of gives us insight on the interplay between these two in the book of Galatians, talking about the law, and now our relationship with Jesus. And he says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 23, he says, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law is our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. God gave the law to instruct, and in a sense, to protect. It was our tutor for a time. But once faith came, faith in Jesus, 
We no longer have need for this tutor. We have everything that God has always planned for us. So there's no need to turn back to old ways. And as we turn towards this new covenant, this old covenant is passing away and it will one day vanish completely. And what will be left standing is the supremacy of Christ, the superiority of his love, and the incredible grace and power of his new covenant that's made available to all of us. So I'm going to invite our worship leaders back up to the platform as we close out our time together. As we think through this new covenant that is made available to all of us, this promise of new life, better life, and life everlasting with Jesus, I want us to consider what our hearts most truly desire in this moment. Whether we are lifelong believers, whether we find ourselves in a season of questioning, whether we're rededicating our lives, we're new believers, or we simply have yet to place our faith in Jesus. I want to give all of us an opportunity this morning to step into that new covenant, to make known to God that you desire the relationship that he is offering to all of us without doing or earning or striving. Jesus made the perfect sacrifice. His great love has delivered us from the domain of darkness and it's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son where we are his now and forever. And if that's the life that you want, all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. We have a greater high priest who offers us a greater, better covenant. And should we desire that covenant, all we must do is take that step of faith together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this new covenant that offers us new life and life more abundant. We thank you for the profound sense of love that we have in you. Thank you that we are yours now and forevermore. God, I pray that we would all make that active decision right now to receive all that you provide. To say, yes, I want you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, move in our midst. Move in power. Do a miraculous work. Awaken us to the gospel, Lord. Awaken us to new life. And I thank you that you will do everything that you've promised. We praise you now and forevermore. We pray this in your name. Amen.